Я хочу поблагодарить вас за приглашение. Тотальная мезоректомия у больных со сложным тазом, традиционная лапароскопическая мезоректомия. Я покажу вам некоторые слайды, может быть, даже видео. И вот э, тема, которую я говорю, э, буду говорить, она связана с лапароскопическим вмешательством. Мы долго думали о низких уровнях инвазивности и э, старались найти пути. Я могу даже говорить, может быть, в большей степени о робототерапевтических роботизированных. Когда-то было сказано о том, что недостаточно просто какие-то применять новые методы. Если вы, с другой стороны, вы можете сразу не преуспеть. Во-вторых, вы можете остаться без пациентов. Поэтому, несмотря на изменения, прогрессирование технологий, необходим, как сегодня говорилось, опыт и очень высокая квалификация. Пришли роботы, у нас прекрасные возможности визуализации, но если мы... В, нашей, в нашем веке, с другой стороны, не осваиваем новые технологии, мы тоже можем остаться без пациентов. Какие э, проблемы связаны с тотальной мезоректомиктомией? Это сложная э, операция, несмотря на то, какой метод и подход вы выбираете. Э, лабороскопия открытая э, или... Сейчас есть новые подходы, подход снизу, или вы выбираете сверху, все равно это трудно, это непростое лечение, и, и э, трудности, с моей точки зрения, э, связанные с минимально инвазивной лапароскопией, следующий э, хирург должен знать анатомию, если вы видите, вы делаете. И поэтому ваша экспозиция, ваше умение видеть, ваши знания анатомии, это ключ, конечно. Затем выделение тканей, естественно, отведение, ретракция тканей. Многие верили, что пока э, э, вы не сможете увидеть поле, пока вы не отвели очень много тканей. Но технологии меняются, и люди обучаются лапароскопической хирургии, уже не всегда нужно такое поле. Много спорят о том, какие используют энергетические источники, биполяр или что-то, или монополяр, или что-то другое. Идут обсуждения, какие энергетические источники. Мы также знаем, что пост-радиотерапия, это тоже вопрос, и Иногда мы думаем, что мы имеем дело с региональной опухолью, и э, э, наши ошибки приводят и неправильное применение радиотерапии, котек и ткани и так далее. И мы знаем, что э, э, есть разницы по даже полу, и есть... Еще одна причина, по которой мы начали искать новые методы, и теперь разрабатывается подход снизу, это трудность доступа. И я буду вам показывать, как это потенциально можно преодолеть. У нас есть публикации класси результатов классических исследований в Англии. Исследовались лапароскопические подходы, смотрели CRM-позитивность, смотрели уровень конверсии. И а, до сих пор продолжается анализ. И а, как мы должны определять наши критерии и стандарты? Для этого нужно понимать, а, куда мы ст стремимся. Хорошие хирургические результаты. Качество жизни – это главный вопрос для пациентов, и мы должны проводить то, что называется органосохраняющая операция, и качество жизни пост, после операции, как я сказала, важно, и техника да, выбранная должна быть хороша для хирурга, для пациента, и, конечно, она должна быть реальна с точки зрения экономических показателей. Я хочу поговорить о двух исследованиях, коротко, возможно, вы видели сегодня уже достаточно, да, Данных. Ну вот это исследование, которое недавно опубликовано 
в Ланцет, в онкологическом разделе. Вы можете посмотреть на количество пациентов, 30 центров, 8 стран. И здесь оценивалось качество хирургии, в том числе с использованием забранного материала. И можно ожидать, что лапароскопический подход может дать вам, конечно, изначально ожидать лучшие результаты. Но вот что важно, если мы смотрим на наши образцы, на извлеченные ткани. Здесь мы можем получить другую картину по позитивности и по краям резекции. Вы видите здесь цифры. А нужно сказать, что работали очень опытные лапароскопические хирурги и работали хорошие хирурги, которые оценивали забранные ткани. Исследовались ли, ли лимфоузлы? Обратите внимание на цифры. I would like to share a couple of these slides because I think this is a very important trial. This is not being spoken much in the Western world, but this was a very well-designed study. This is a Korean trial which looked at the role of laparoscopy for locally advanced rectal cancer. Because the argument really is not so much whether you could do it in an oncologically safe way, but can you do it in locally advanced tumor in a safe way? So this was a study which was a very well-designed study. They only look at mid to low rectal cancer, only if they had post chemotherapy, T3, N0 to N2 disease, 117 laparoscopic arm and 117 open. And the primary endpoint they chose to do was a three year disease free survival. This is the process of randomization. If, if you look at it, for me the most important thing is right at the bottom here. They did not lose a single patient in follow-up immediately for analysis, which means that this is quite a good and powerful study that allows us to look at the data very, very carefully. And these are the common denominators, as you would expect. Um, lots of them have had 0 to 3 percent. You can see this is the distance of tumor from the anal verge, radiotherapy as you would expect, and chemotherapy post-operatively as well. So these are the results of the study. Um, you can see when they look at three-year disease-free survival, 72.5% for open arm and nearly 80% for laparoscopic arm. So equivalent disease-free survival comparing both technique. Overall survival, almost similar. No difference in terms of whichever option of technique you use. And when they looked at local recurrence, this is again very, very impressive, even in locally advanced tumor. So they concluded from their study that laparoscopic resection for locally advanced rectal cancer after chemotherapy was not inferior in terms of three-year survival. But the most important thing is right at the bottom, which is that it is only justified when done by a well-qualified or well-trained surgeon. So training is hugely important, and knowing where the goalpost is hugely important as well. Um, this is uh, Danilo Miskovic um, work with me and some of my colleagues from Russia also help us do it. Uh, Professor Zarkov and, and Alexei Karuchan, they help us um, form this standardized structured consensus meeting internationally. What we were trying to do in this paper was somehow standardize the technique of laparoscopic TME first uh, before we could start comparing data. And it is important uh, to have a standardization of the technique. So I'm just going to show you a few slides for our Portsmouth rectal cancer data for laparoscopic TME and then show you some of the video clips before I finish. Um, this is eight-year data, 405 cases, um, nothing different in terms of age or BMI as you'd expect. 64% were male patient, 80% of those treated were mid to low rectal cancer. And we do have in Portsmouth very selective radiotherapy approach. Um, we give only 23% of the patient chemoradiation beforehand if the CRM is involved or if it's a T4 tumor or if it is threatened less than one millimeter. So these are the clinical outcomes for that series, conversion rate of 1.5%, 
major complications, 2.5%. Mortality is less than 0.5. Reoperation rate is 5%. And length of stay is six days. Major anastomotic leak in our series was 1.8%. These are the anastomotic leak requiring reoperation. When we looked at radiological intervention, then our leak rate is 5.3%, all inclusive. Reoperation rate, we already have spoken about. 84% of those patients end up having an anterior resection and a low join. About 12%, 12.5% in effect had abdominal pineal resection in our series with couple either having Hartman's or proctocolectomy, I think one patient. So these are um, the long-term results, which this, this is the paper which is uh, in progress and it will be published fairly soon. Um, our R0 resection rate in our series is 96.5%. CRM positivity rate is 3.5%. Local recurrence to date is 1.5% with 13% patient having distant local recurrence. So I'm just going to move away from the podium because I can't have a laptop here and just share with you um, a couple of clips of our techniques to give you an idea of uh, what I'm talking about. Some of you may already have seen it, so I do apologize if it looks familiar. So I'm just going to go away. I was told I can take this away and, and show you the technique. So this is um, a post-radiotherapy male patient with uh, long course chemo radiotherapy being given. So this is a start of the TME. The reason I wanted to sit is I can fast forward it in, in the interest of time. So I start posteriorly. I use monopolar diathermy hook uh, as a choice. And although even in male patient, the, the plane to start with is very tight, but the clue really is to start posteriorly and get what I call mobility on the specimen. So the posterior approach is the key to start with. This is to give you an idea of how tight anteriorly the male pelvis can look. I mark the incision at the peritoneal reflection and then release it laterally. And you can see that if you have done all of this from the back side, it is only a matter of releasing the peritoneum at the top to allow you to see the circumferential margin. Then I develop the plane anteriorly. Counter traction is provided by my assistant and my left hand is holding the peritoneal reflection. I routinely use a, a straight proline suture for male patient as well to give me access anteriorly the counter traction provided by my assistant and my hand working and as you could see that yes with radiotherapy you see more tissue edema but it is still possible if you just take your time and have patients to see the plane develop very slowly this is coming to the right side you can see the air on the right side this is the left side, now you can see that all you got to do is to have enough tension and paint so it drops away from you. The reason I prefer to use monopolar diathermy, there is no right or wrong um, tool really in my view, but the reason I prefer to use this is that I know that if I go outside the plane it would bleed, so it would tell me that I have made a, a mistake. So I stick to the monopolar. Now posteriorly now, 30 degree view, looking upwards. And I personally think this is a very important step to release the enococcygeal ligament posteriorly to make your stapling easier at the later stage. So you just got to spend a lot more time releasing the specimens circumferentially. And it really is a, a gentle traction and a painting at the back of the hook that allows you to do this. So I'm just going to move this in the interest of time again. You've gone deeper. You can see the buttocks. You're right the way onto the elevator plate. This is coming to the right side. This is an important step to realize that left pelvic nerve plexus get attached to the specimen um, on the side. So I think if I just bring this slightly in the view for you to appreciate. 
And all you have to do really here is to just paint the top layer and the nerves would just go away from it because we often make a mistake of going either into the specimen or wide. No anterior dissection and so forth. So I'm just going to show you a couple of those videos in different patients to give you an idea. So stapling is an important issue. This is checking that everything is free. We have a um, we use um, flexible sigmoidoscopy and digital examination before we divide. The problem with the stapling is that your fulcrum effect is about here and you're trying to do divide something right down here. Lots of people have used suprapubic port to divide the rectum anteroposteriorly. I'm just going to move this away to give you an idea. So what I do is I use the same port but as I have gone parallel to the package or the, or the lumen of the tube, I pronate my hand and then aim to divide it between 12 to 6 o'clock in two firings. That's, that's the idea from a start um, because side to side there is not enough space. I use green cartridge if it is a post radiotherapy rectum because the staple height is better. It takes two firing if you have gone all the way around it and then you can see your staple line enter posteriorly to firing and this is the assessment of the mesorectal package which look reasonably good even with the difficult access. So oh, this was uh, something that I wanted to share but it's okay. I'll move on and, and give you an idea of something else. This is a very old video but I deliberately wanted to show you. This is 2007 time I think. Um, a locally advanced tumor long course chemotherapy. You can see this, this is the left seminal vesicle was involved or there was a suggestion that seminal vesicle is involved and we decided to do it um, the same standardized way as you would. So I'm just going to sort of fast forward it with you watching it. So start at the back again, nothing different. I always say the TME is an operation between the two nerves really as you could see posteriorly, so develop the plane posteriorly a long way before you come to, there you go, you sort of gently, the traction is almost progressive, you don't want to hold and pull it very hard because otherwise you would tear it. Sometime I use this little pledget to give me a, a, a blunt traction, if you use a big swab it takes up all the space so you have no space to see, um, again you're going all the way around now. And this allows you, when you do the posterior dissection, this allows you to get what I call mobility on the specimen because then you have a mobility, you can move right and left. This is the pelvic right nerve now, you're inside the nerve painting it. You just have to keep going there, A-frame, medialize it, nerves down here and you progress. So it is, it is possible. I'm just going to move it forward because this, the difficulty in him was not the posterior bit but the anterior bit, the right nerve is there. I mark this, you go wide, left side is being dropped now as you can see as I showed you in the previous videos. The, the point perhaps I'm trying to make is that yes, difficult TME is difficult. It is not going to become easy um, but it become relatively less difficult. That's the term I'm using if you standardize your approach and if you do them with a method. So do the right side, left side was desmoplastic reaction still involved. I'm just going to move it because, okay, dividing it firing and you would see. So what I end up doing was took the part of the, the vesicle, the vas, the part of the vas just there on the front of the specimen you would see. Turned out this was just a desmoplastic reaction. It wasn't, you know, after post radiotherapy it had become sterile. So it is possible in cases like these as well and I think the last one perhaps is no radiotherapy. This is uh, the TME we did in Lisbon, I think in one of the courses. I'm just going to move it forward to you to tell you how simple cases without radiotherapy look. So I'm trying to sort of show you different patients. You can see posteriorly you develop with a hook, go a long way posterior, then you mark it on the side and anterior. This is what I showed you, right pelvic nerve dissecting. You can see that now you, you're, you're releasing it laterally. 
So again, if, you, if you've got your traction counter traction right, it literally is just painting inside this left nerve which runs along here. And you can see my clue is the specimen shape. So anything that is rounded that belongs to me, things which are not rounded go away from me. So right down to the pelvic floor, counter traction, front of the denovalis fascia outside, right nerve is just again here. It looks very, very boringly similar and that's what you want to achieve really in your surgery. So again, all the way down, coming across the denovalis fascia, two firings. I'll just let it finish. So second firing, cut with a scissor and it would give you an idea of looking at the specimen. So for me really the key is what, not what you take out from the pelvis, the key really is what you leave behind and that for me is a surrogate marker of your TME surgery. So what I'm trying to show you is exposure and then if you can see, you can do. So I'm just going to come out there and just finish off by showing you one last thing and I have a conclusion then not anatomy. This is relevant, I mean this is coming now, robotic surgery is, I have not enough time to show you all of this but to give you an idea, everybody say what are the advantages, you know this is a, a, a robotic TME male pelvis, the right pelvic side wall in my mind is a, a real advantage with this machine because this allows you to run parallel to the specimen, these are unedited clips so I'm really sorry for that but I thought I'd just show you deliberately to give you an idea of what the real surgery look like. This is some live demonstration. This is the pelvic side wall. You can see the air and you can paint inside the air. The, the right-handed instrument would allow you to stay parallel to the package of the specimen, not go perpendicular to it as the laparoscopic approach would do. So again, you know, this is traction, counter traction, same principle. Left side have just gone down. So you, you would see this is the same steps. What you would probably appreciate is that even if it's with a robot, I have not sort of come up with a new operation and not trying to invent a new operation. So this would give you an idea. Left side now. And you would see the gap that exists. There. So I'll let it run on a real time. You can see you rotate it in and you keep painting the air and that allows you to go all the way down. So I think you got the idea. So traction, counter traction, the view is much better and you use the painting brush technique, this time with a scissor circumnavigating the specimen, just like this. So it has advantage to improve access, it has advantage to allow you to work in a better field. So I'm just about finished. So. Okay, so have I got the, okay. I'll finish off from here. I've already sort of given the word. So the conclusion really is that total mesorectal excision surgery remains a challenging operation regardless of how we do it. The key in my idea remain the concept of precision surgery. So the idea that perhaps new technology would end up giving us a new operation to my mind is not fair and right. I think the concept is the same. It is an anatomical precision surgery which we all aspire to learn and should aspire to learn still. I think now we know enough that a minimal access approach does provide better short-term outcome and in my personal view the use of robotic platforms certainly is something that we need to look at if we're looking at evolution where it's going to do. So people say that most things in life are in the mind. I always say the only limitation is your imagination. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm grateful to be here.